Stay with us as we explore and share evidence-based research, information, and training methods. Here's your host, Hussein Jabai. Welcome to episode 11 of RIT Team Radio, where I'm joined by Ryan Provencher, and we're going to be talking about simple tools. I'll let uh, Ryan here in a second go into more of the ideology and, and the approach behind this, but uh, the overall thought process is you want to become more healthy or become healthy in general. You want to become fit or more fit or fitter if that's a word. So you need to be able to do something about it, right? Is there a single approach or is there potentially a system and alternative methods you can implement so that you can achieve your health and wellness goals? So Ryan, I appreciate you joining us today. And um, I, I want you to go through the boat of uh, pretty much what is Simple Tools or or how did you approach this system? Yeah, no, and uh, thanks for having me on once again, Hussein. I really appreciate it. And uh, hello to everybody out there that's listening. Um, you know, today I just want to just acknowledge that one of the, the first steps to, to improving your fitness uh, as a firefighter or in general is really to, to remove roadblocks and uh, and. Uh, provide yourself better access uh, to different options for fitness. So what comes to mind for me as I reflect on my own personal experience, my own journey and things that I've done in my own life to manage my own health and fitness and things I've shared as a coach with other firefighters based on what I've learned over the years. So um, one thing that I've really been drawn to over the last 10 years is this whole idea of just simple tools uh, being incorporated into our physical training programs, uh, for a lot of reasons. And again, this isn't to discount any other uh, traditional strength training equipment, whether it's, you know, bench or squat racks or any of that stuff or traditional cardio equipment, treadmills, step mills, all that stuff. All that stuff's great. Uh, all of it has a place for, for firefighter fitness. Absolutely. But what I've been drawn to uh, for a, a lot of different reasons is, is this whole idea of incorporating simple tools into our physical training programs. What does that mean? To me, it's, uh, kettlebells, med balls, sandbag, steel clubs, these, these implements that are uh, very simple. They're, uh, you, can, you can load movement patterns in, a, in many different ways. You can load in ways that are unique that you cannot load with more traditional equipment, uh, joint friendly in terms of decompressing joints through maybe swinging motions versus constantly compressing through uh, more traditional strength training exercises. The, the, there's no maintenance required for this stuff. It's inexpensive. It doesn't take much to store. It's ideal for group exercise. So I just want to put it out there that, again, there's no no right or wrong way, but there's just different options out there that can really remove roadblocks either for an individual or for a group or for an agency such as a fire department. When it can, you know, I first want to acknowledge the fact that, as you stated, Yes, you can do traditional lifting. It's not just completely abandon that, oh. that thought process or implement. There's there there's you get good benefits out of it, great benefits out of traditional lifting. But how about you work on implementing um, these these variations of uh, tools and resources and equipment that, like you mentioned, can even benefit you in ways that traditional lifting can't. Um, I liked how you mentioned the storing capacity. Um, depending on what the equipment is, you know, you, you don't need a full fetch power rack and barbell and all these different plates. Uh, you can get great workouts with some of the equipment you mentioned, and we'll go through a little bit more, but you can get amazing workouts out of it and even further benefit. You went from traditional equipment, like a barbell, uh, just by how it places strain on, on the body itself. Um, so go through and, and mention more of how you got to that point, right? In the realm of traditional lifting and through your experience, both with your fitness journey, but then also the application through your, uh, through the fire service and your career of how did you, or why did you transition that, that mentality, not completely abandoning, uh, traditional lifting or saying it's bad, but just implementing more non-traditional resources. Yeah, and I, that's why I like the phrase simple tools because we are talking about tools in the toolbox. It's not one's better than another. It's each has an application 
depending on the goals or, or whatever you're striving to do either as an athlete or a coach. So, so yeah, just kind of going back and reflecting on my own journey. So I started lifting weights in my garage at age 13 with my dad, he was in law enforcement and he was big into strength training. And we had those old school cement weights that would kind of crack and, and you'd see the cement on the inside. And he just taught me how to do some basic strength training as a teenager. And I, I just fell in love with it. I was, you know, big into Schwarzenegger and Stallone and all the action movies at the time. And that really did set me on my path in terms of having this passion for, for physical training. And then, um, you know, I went to Washington State University, got my degree in exercise science and really had the opportunity to build on just this base knowledge that I had and this passion that I had for strength training. And, uh, but that's really mostly what I had been exposed to was what I would call, and again, this, there's no dog around this. This is just how I frame it for myself and how I choose to explain it to other folks is what I would call more traditional strength training. Back in my day, there was no real accounting for mobility. There was no real accounting for recovery. There was certainly cardio, but no specific application to energy system development and stuff like that. So, so that was kind of my first, I call that 1.0 for myself and even for my coaching at the time. Where I, where I discovered 2.0 was when Mark Verstegen wrote his book, Core Performance. And uh, Mark also went to Washington State. I, I knew him a little bit as a strength coach at Wazoo when I was there. And so I, I followed his trajectory as he built out Athlete's Performance, now Exos. But that book, uh, I, I dug into that big time. So to me, and again, the, the term functional fitness is different for different people, but that was my first introduction to functional fitness in, as the way I see it, where you're, you're challenging stability, you're, you're building comprehensive programs to include what he called regeneration and physio ball work and energy system development. And my body felt different. Uh, I, I, was, I reached a level of fitness that I had not experienced before. And then I started coaching it in our fire department. Every station in our apartment has Mark's book, core performance still there 23 years later. Uh, we did that in our academies for a long time. So that was kind of my first evolution from what I'm calling 1.0 to what I'm calling my 2.0. Yeah. And I like how just uh, kind of reflecting on your initial impression of what was training in the beginning for you and then how that mentality changed. And um, just as you were talking, I was kind of reflecting on what was my initial impression? Um, and, and it was literally, so I, and growing up, small town, weight room was like one of those metal sheds and you had the industrial fan at the end. And yeah. um, we had one poster, one poster at the end. And I, I don't know uh, if you know Dan Green, who does a ton of powerlifting. I want to say he was involved with Animal, but Power, powerlifting posters kind of ruled the realm, you know, when uh, within our gym, and it was Dan Green, and then uh, he was just just jacked, dude. He was looking down, he had a beanie on, and he's just it was a poster of just him being jacked, like it, it had no, it, it had a quote beside it, but and he did powerlifting, so you're like trying to bodybuild to look like him, but he does powerlifting, and it was just interesting. Uh, but then that's when the video circulated with Pete Rubish, who's a powerlifter who he was the one that all the videos went viral where he was deadlifting an insane amount of weights in his basement in front of a washer and dryer. Um, <laughs> and it just went great because he would lift it and he would throw it down and yell. And you just wanted to deadlift like crazy because of him. And th those were my initial impressions of yeah, yeah. how do I, how do I look like these guys? How do I be strong like these guys? And so it introduced the big three and then the big four when uh, one of them uh, said pull-ups are one of the main lifts you have to increase. And uh, But then playing sports, I realized like you you can't just be in the weight room and you can't I, just do the big three and big four. I, so, you know, you introduce sleds, you introduce a strong man and doing medleys and, and so forth. And so that was you know, what is functional fitness? Uh, for me, the introduction was more of the sport realm of, okay, if you're playing this position in football or you transition to basketball, how does training change for those? And nothing on uh, our program or those that were involved, but being a small school and it wasn't really pushed, you know, what credentials were for who runs the weight room. We didn't get the best supervision or the best programming as athletes where we had to figure out, you know, hey, I'm 
I'm getting kicked around on the field. I need to do a little bit more. And you start doing your own little research because you don't want to be the person that's being thrown around on the field. And so anyways, that it took a second to like reflect my first introduction to that and throughout my exercise science career and through academics and so forth and starting to work with um, fire and rescue and law enforcement and, and, and the tactical community, it was kind of that same approach of, okay, why? Yes, big three, big four. But most people see those as, okay, the bench press, I'm working chest or the deadlift, I'm working back. But really it's, I'm doing a pressing movement or a hinging movement. So I kind of want to use this as a segue of how should we perceive exercises, right? Should we, especially looking at uh, more uh, uh, firefighting and looking at fire and rescue, should we say, hey, we're going to go hit chest, we're going to go hit legs, we're going to go hit calves, and we're going to go hit biceps? Or I guess what is potentially a better system of establishing what exercises you should be implementing into your training program? Yeah, and I think that's, you know, again, a transition. And, and for me, you know, we talked about 1.0 being traditional. We talk about 2.0 being uh, functional. In my experience, now 3.0 is tactical fitness. And my first introduction to what I'm calling tactical fitness, and again, not to get into dogma or to define something, but just for me, how I look at it, came with an introduction to a, a guy by the name of Scott Sonnen. I was literally at the fire station. I was a pure fitness trainer. He walks in off the street and he he comes up to one of our admin folks says, hey, I need to talk to a, a fitness person. I happen to be at the station. I'm talking to this guy. And, and he says, hey, the cops challenge you to a tactical fitness competition. Uh, are you interested? And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, but yes, if, it, if we're competing with the cops, absolutely. Come to find out, he goes over to the, the cop shop, says the same thing. Hey, the firefighters challenge you to this tactical fitness competition. And and so what happened was we we did. We went to a local health club. We had this fundraiser, and it was a, a tactical fitness competition. But he brought uh, steel clubs. He brought kettlebells. He brought gym rings. He had parallel bars. And here's, you know, this group of guys were all very fit, but we hadn't really done any of these movements that he was challenging us to do. Yeah, I'd bench and I squat or I'd do this or that, but now we're swinging this or we're, you know, uh, we're hinging and we're pressing and we're pulling and we're going through these movement patterns that even at the time, what, it wasn't in that context, but now all these years later, I can really see the application of it. So to kind of come back to your question about movement patterns versus muscle groups, when we're talking about physical training for uh, first responders, it, it just takes it to a whole nother level, not only in how we approach our training, but also in how we approach our teaching and our coaching. So if I'm in Recruit Academy and I've already taught all of our recruits about movement patterns and we've talked about loading movement patterns and we do that as part of our physical training, now we're out on the drill ground and we're lifting ladders or we're deploying hose or whatever the case may be. And I can on the drill ground make reference to biomechanics in, in a specific movement pattern, it's no different than what we talked about in the gym. So you just find, you just observe the recruit, immediately find a better body position based on a coaching cue that we applied to their exercise. And it immediately applies to their the occupational skill. You can't, you can't do that with a, a muscle group. You can't say chest, you know, it, you, you're not, you know, versus, hey, press or. You provide it in sequence. You go, okay, cat, hamstring. Uh, shoulder, uh, yeah. bicep. All right, go. Like it, it doesn't work that way. And so, if you think about it, that's what a movement pattern is. But it's teaching the brain that sequence, right? Yeah. You could verbally say, "All right, you're going to use your chest. Now your the the front of your shoulders. Now you're going to use your tricep." Like you could say that, but uh, if you just teach different variations of pressing movements fantastic right you teach rotation you taught, teach hinging like it's a it's integrating that motion which has a sequence to it but you don't think the individual segments you can flow through that those movements yeah and that's where i really love incorporating simple tools now into this whole idea of now we're, we're talking about movement patterns uh, more so than muscle groups and now we're talking about loading movement patterns and we can do that in a lot of different ways of course and Body, body weight, in my opinion, is a, a really great place to start, making sure people can move their body weight safely in these different movement patterns before loading it. And now you're introducing, let's just say, a, a kettlebell to do a, a vertical press or a, a 
sandbag to do a loaded lunge or a med ball to do a, a more explosive hinge movement in, in a floor slam or something like that. So now you're, you're teaching these recruits to load these different movement patterns. You can use lighter weight. You're, you're using these simple tools. Maybe you're, you're introducing a kettlebell swing. And, and that tool is just really unique in optimizing that movement pattern versus something that you've used in the past as a more traditional implement, like a barbell, for example. So uh, I just think it opens up a whole new world of opportunity to teach and train firefighters to move better and then also apply that specifically to the biomechanics that we see in these different tasks asked of us as firefighters. When expanding beyond teaching the movement patterns is like we mentioned before, where you're getting these additional benefits, right? Doing a traditional, let's say a deadlift as a hinge, um, not being a squat, but being an actual hinge. Or if we look at, you know, barbell back squats for a squatting movement, you're not going to get the same uh, stability benefits as if you're going through a movement pattern, like uh, let's say a, a, a non-weighted reverse lunge, let's say let's add an instrument, whether it's a sandbag or something. And with your reverse lunge, you're doing a rotation, whether you're rotating, you know, away or you're rotating into the lunge that it's irrelevant depending on what your approach for that is. But doing that, and let's say you're not even holding anything, you're completely changing that segment. Let's say you're holding a sandbag and you're doing a single leg RDL, or let's say instead of holding it to your chest, you're holding uh, I've done a, a little bit of seal mace work and let and I'm going to say, depending on how far away the ball of that seal mace is, is going to change your world on how you're performing that task. 100%. So ju just, just stuff like that, where how do we get additional benefit by potentially doing similar categories of movement? Cause I go back to saying a hinge or a squat or a lunge press, drag, whatever, right? The, the different categories of movement, but how do we get further benefit by adding these tools, these resources, and then just expanding the possibilities? That, that's really what you're doing. You're, at, at, you're adding to the possibilities of what you can program into your routine. If you only stick with a barbell, yes, you can get super creative, but you are very limited. If you say, I'm only using a barbell, I'm using plates, what can I do with it? By adding these other resources, you open a whole new world, um, and especially if you go outside of um, strength and you go outside of endurance, you start looking at stability and you start looking at potentially mobility routines and warmups. Absolutely. And and so taking it a step further, if, if, if we're programming, let's say, say for Recruit Academy, and we're making sure that we're really capturing all of the movement patterns in a way that's well balanced and well thought out. And then we're choosing the tools that we're gonna to use to load that, whether it's a kettlebell or a sandbag, med ball, steel club, uh, par parallel bars, TRX, suspension trainers, all of these things uh, are, are easily adaptable into these programs. And then you look at, well, uh, let's use a 20 minute interval to now, we're, we're doing strength training, certainly, and now let's also tap into different energy systems in these intervals. So you could do a 20-10 split, for example, and, and that is more, much more of an anabolic energy system development protocol versus uh, as many rounds as possible in 20 minutes. And I just love kind of putting the mindset in, into the this approach for recruits is, hey, imagine you're on a fire ground and imagine your officer gives you a series of tasks to perform on the bottle that you're wearing. And the, you know, on average firefighters can get about 20 minutes uh, out of a bottle, hopefully. Um, and so it's just kind of a, it's a, in my mind, a fun way to train. It's very specific to us as firefighters because we're loading movement patterns that mimic firefighting tasks. And we're incorporating these into a training protocol uh, and, it, and it could really be all over the board in terms of energy systems. And, and that's where the balance comes in also uh, over the course of a recruit academy and managing that as well. But in a very efficient way, you're, you're warming up for these specific training exercises. You're training for this 20 minute you know, interval, regardless of how you program that. And then you've got an intentional cool down and 10 minute warm up, 20 minute workout, 10 minute cool down. You've got a very efficient workout in a recruit academy setting that allows 
the recruit to train in a way that's very specific. It's, it's comprehensive. It's, it's periodized over time to make sure we're managing training load and all that stuff. Uh, it, it, to me, it just really, in my experience as a, as an athlete, certainly, and then also as a coach, it, it has just opened up this uh, opportunity. Well, and, and I like how the, the initial approach with the Academy is, integrating the movement or, or teaching the movement, integrating the movement where a lot of times, uh, maybe not, uh, from a coaching perspective, but just, uh, individuals in general start implementing exercises where, Hey, I want to start working out. Let's just say someone, a, a firefighter wants to start working out and they choose exercises. Cause that's just what they found online or what someone else did or, or whatever. But not as many people without a coach, and then even a lot of coaches potentially don't take a step back and say, yes, you've been in the fire service for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, but do you know proper mechanics? Do you know the movement patterns first? And that's where uh, I see a lot of uh, even coaches struggle with, Yes, even someone who's worked out, I've worked out with plenty of, or I've trained plenty of individuals that have 10 years of training, whether it was with another trainer, by themselves, so forth. But my first phase with everyone is, let's start very basic. Let me figure out if do we need to do bilateral movements where you're using both limbs, you're doing traditional squats or so forth, or can we do single limb movements? You might, I see it all the time, right? All the snazzy social media videos and posts where you know, it's split squats or lunges and this and that and RDLs and what you're, well, and there's plenty of other things where people are standing on uh, Bozu balls and doing overhead presses and right, there's all the other things, but you see this and you go, I'm going to add the Bulgarian split squat in, I'm going to add split squats, I'm going to add, you know, uh, uh, single arm overhead press, but no one takes that second to reflect and say, do I have the sh shoulder mobility to overhead press? Do I, can I support myself with one leg, right? It, it, usually the discussion is someone sees a video and goes, looks simple enough, or watches it from a different perspective and go, there is no way I can do that. And then just doesn't attempt to get to that point. So I, I guess what's kind of your thought process on that of, you know, the initial approach, let's say out of the academy incumbent personnel where they might not have as much experience with movement patterns. Yeah. And so you hit on a couple of things there. Uh, one is just really, and I, people may get sick of us hearing the word intentional uh, in all of our conversations, but, you know, one of my favorite fire service authors and instructors is Dave Dodson. And in his uh, incident safety officer book, he speaks specifically about intellectual aggressiveness versus arbitrary aggressiveness as it relates to firefighting operations. And his point is, hey, you can be take an intellectual approach, a well thought out approach and not sacrifice time and be safer and have a better positive outcome because you're being more uh, intentional about how you're approaching it. In my mind, fitness is it's the same thing, right? So when you're talking about adding in this or adding in that or, or loading something overhead without first kind of doing some assessment or or looking at biomechanics and range of motion, uh, coming back to this whole idea of simple tools and movement patterns, once you kind of look at different ways to load movement patterns or you start looking at more complex ways to move in a pattern and you, you reference for even rotation or a lunge with rotation, there's so many ways that we can add complexity to movement patterns. We can load movement patterns in different ways and we can really look at that not in an arbitrary way, but in a way that's very intentional so that we've got different progressions, whether it's just a simple progression is obviously just loading it, more increasing the load, but there's also movement pattern progressions. Just as an example, a split squat is, uh, excuse me, a split lunge is less dynamic than a, a front step lunge where you're stepping forward and stepping back, you're adding a dynamic component to that movement pattern that makes it more complex and that's a progression and at any point whether it's due to fatigue or whatever the underlying issue may be if the athlete's very well versed in their whole plan to progress through a movement or to regress as needed uh what a what a great way to keep them engaged in the workout and then also to 
monitor progress over a much longer period of time in a periodized training program where you can objectively look at all of this because of the intention behind the programming. And with, with intention and figuring out what works, like what progression and even with progression, when you talk about the dynamic or the locomotion pattern, which is providing you with that dynamic uh, principle to the movement is, but understanding why, especially if, and I, I, I've seen this uh, and because you mentioned lunges, is the difference in even just a forward lunge versus a backwards lunge, mm -hmm. right? And the impact it has on that body segment, depending on the strength and health of someone's knees and someone's uh, ankles, right? Lunging forward in that impact versus uh, e slower in the eccentric on the re reverse lunge and less of that impact. And so it goes back to understanding you as the individual, just knowing, okay, not so great ankles, you know, I got a busted knee. Uh, what exercises can I provide a little bit of a challenge, but what is not going to destroy my knee? What is not going to put so much strain on my ankle? And it's, again, it's taking that step back to let's start very basic. Let's start fundamental and let's figure out a progression or uh, I like how you navigated that of two segments, right? You can either add load or add complexity. You can, and, and the complexity is, is a whole different ballpark. There's so many ways to do that. Sure. And that could be going from two legs or two limbs to one limb. Okay. But don't, don't add both. Don't go from two limbs to one limb and add load and this and yep. that. Yep. Um, so it's, you know, it, it, it goes a long way for that. But again, you mentioned assessing first and knowing your body and people, people tell me all the time when I walk into agencies, Hey, because of course I'm I'm the quote unquote fitness guy. Oh my gosh, he's going to tell us to work out, or he's going to tell us some kind of health fact or something, right? And usually when we start talking about workouts, is oh I can't do that because I have a bad back or I have a bad knee or I have this or that or experience that. It's like that's great. How do we make the most of what you can do, and how do we build up that baseline? How do we work with what you're able to do? Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, that's where I just see so much value in this using simple tools, looking at movement patterns, really empowering the individual to take ownership of their own movement and their own uh, well-being. And then once you're in a group, if, if you've taken the time to really educate and work with the individual about you know, where they're at and giving them some guidance, how to progress, how to regress. Uh, you and I have talked a lot about um, uh, training metrics, like uh, subjective and objective training metrics. Again, those are tools that you can equip people with, whether it's movement rating, intensity rating, discomfort rating, and, and providing parameters around how to use those to not only protect yourself in your training, but also to progress and regress as needed to stay engaged in the workout in a way that's healthy and holistic. Um, you're equipping the individuals with that. And then whether you're training as a crew of incumbent firefighters at a station or you're working with recruits, you, you push the go button on whatever training protocol you have. And you're confident as a coach that each of the athletes kind of has their own plan, but now you're training in a group setting. What, a, what an awesome way to, to, to build teamwork, to, to take that competitive edge out of it. No one's competing against anyone else. You're only competing against yourself and not in a way that's negative. It's, Hey, stay healthy and, and progress in a way that's healthy. So you're going to have to remind them that they're not competing. against. Yeah. Oh yeah. Other. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> But, it's easier said than done. Yeah. But, but with that, you know, I want you to add if you could implement, uh, let's say an agency, let's say an academy is investing in equipment, whether yep. you name drop brands or not, or just types of equipment or so forth. What are some simple things, simple tools, simple resources uh, that academies or agencies can invest in? Um, or at least look at whether it's the individual or the agency that they can implement. Um, what I guess what were what are some recommendations from you? Yeah, so I've just got a list of go-to tools that I've used for ten years plus uh, in a, a lot of different recruit academy settings, and it for all the reasons we talked about, inexpensive. That's the big thing. You you can equip a fire station with a wide complement of tactical fitness equipment. These simple tools for less than the cost of one commercial treadmill. So that's one thing. Goes you a never, long way. <laughs> yeah. Goes a long way. And, and, yeah. and 
firefighters break stuff, but you, you have a hard time breaking a kettlebell, right? So um, <laughs> that's not so a challenge, but yeah, not a challenge, <laughs> yeah. not a challenge. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. That doesn't mean it wouldn't happen. But uh, so again, uh, I mentioned kettlebells, sandbags. I love steel clubs. It's a unique tool, and like the steel mace, it it just provides a leverage disadvantage that you can't really get with any other piece of equipment. It's just unique and and uh, really helpful that way. Uh, TRX or suspension trainers, gym rings, that sort of thing. Parallel bars that really allows to get into some ground engagement. That's unique. Uh, to that piece of equipment, uh, plow boxes for stepping up and down, um, battle ropes, and people. I've seen uh, firefighters use hose, uh, old hose to, we've, for battle we've, ropes. We've done our fair share. Yeah, that's all, yeah. that's all we initially had was out of commission hose, and it was everything and anything you could build with it. Yeah, and that's the thing you can you you can you can recreate some of this loading with simple things just around the fire station. And then, you know, exercise bands, foam rolls, yoga mats, those aren't the, maybe as cool necessarily, but really important to include as part of the recovery aspect for these workouts and programming and, and doing that. But if you, you know, just that list and you had one or two pieces that, you know, just moderate weight or, or weight that's accessible to, to a, a large number of people, uh, you, you can do so, so much with, with just that. Well, and you hit the nail on the head, right? Some of this equipment might not look as snazzy, even mentioning and, and understanding this, if you're listening, understand this as an individual, but if you're the coach listening to this, we, we know we don't want uh, individuals, whether going through crawls or going in po uh, positions where they're, all, you know, stationary on one knee or so forth, you need a surface that's going to support that. And if you need yoga mats, buy yoga mats, right? Just because it has yoga at the front of it, you can call it just general mats if you want to, if it makes it sound cooler. But it's understanding the intention of that the piece of equipment is because you don't have a surface that supports those kind of movements. So you need a yoga mat. Let's say you need other pieces of equipment. You need to understand one, what are you trying to accomplish with that piece of equipment? Um, and, and then how can you implement it? So um, yeah, there's various, various tools that, that you can utilize. And uh, I guess uh, one thing I want to end with is always the application piece. We talked about resources people can invest in, but I want to mention um, some of the workouts or programs either that you currently have um, or that is upcoming, things you're, things that you are working on. Do you have any uh, tangible material or programs or education that let's say someone wants to become more fit or wants to become more healthy? Uh, where can people find some of the resources that you offer? Uh, so, uh, as you know, Hussein, I, I work with Crackle Magazine, and that's been a platform for me to just put some stuff out there. And, and my goal with this is just to present ideas and maybe a new perspective on things uh, that's different than folks have looked at. So uh, I have been doing the Simple Tools series with Crackle Magazine. Uh, uh, I am the founder of Firefighter Peak Performance, so you can check out firefighterpeakperformance.com. I'm building a uh, what I'm calling a, a fitness and wellness platform that... Uh, in the long term will be a, a very comprehensive resource for firefighters. But for right now, it, it is just these simple tools uh, and, and they're these little training cycles. I call it simple tools workouts, but when you get in there, you'll see there's one peak performance day, but there's three other training days that ramp up to your peak performance day and then a full recovery day to kind of wind back down. And so my goal with these little mini training cycles is just to introduce people to the, the concepts that you and I are talking about today. My goal is just to introduce folks to these in a way that's tangible, that they can try in their own stations with their crew and, and see what they think. And if, if, if y'all try these workouts and you have any questions, my email's in there, hit me up. Uh, I, I would really look forward to connecting with anyone that's interested in doing a deeper dive on some of these concepts. When we uh we appreciate well one we, I appreciate you Ryan for for jumping on here and and joining us for this discussion and then two for those that are listening we appreciate uh, you taking the time to to listen to this episode and if you have questions if you have comments if you want us to ramble about everything and anything that has to do with health and and wellness and and so forth um, to help you either as the firefighter or a practitioner working with the community um, to be better to be have have a 
uh, longevity of health and be able to implement these concepts into your life and within the agencies that you serve. Uh, feel free to reach out. Definitely hope you enjoyed the episode and uh, be looking uh, out. The goal is once uh, one video a week or one uh, episode a week. So uh, again, if you have uh, anything you want us to ramble about, feel free to reach out. If you have questions for Ryan, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure you mentioned your email. If not, then it's uh, it definitely go to his website. Uh, reach out to him. He'll have some programs coming out soon. And uh, thank you for uh, joining us today.